Good evening and welcome to the Ask Dr. Renee show here at Black Doctor. And in case you have no idea where you're at, you're at blackdoctor.org or you're on LinkedIn or you're on YouTube, you're somewhere on Facebook. Do me a huge favor though, share, 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 whatever platform you're watching us on, make sure you share the broadcast. I guarantee there will be some information this afternoon that will help somebody you know, or maybe even yourself. So May is Allergy and Asthma Awareness Month. So we've been doing a lot of programming on that because as you know, it's very near and dear to my heart as somebody who has severe asthma and severe food allergies. So I want to make sure that we get you the information so that no one is suffering because the Lord knows I am thriving. I am not suffering. So please, please, please share the broadcast. And um, we might do, I might do another one or two shows for May for Allergy and Asthma Awareness Month. We'll see. But please make sure you share this broadcast. And um, I'm really excited because today we have an allergist who has not been on the platform before. And um, she is uh, amazing and has lots of wonderful knowledge um, because she sees these patients every day. So I'm so excited. Please, everyone, don't forget to share the broadcast. And I welcome Dr. M. Hello. Hello. How are you? I am well. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me here today. Oh, no problem. So let's jump right into it. So have you been seeing, and I'm sure I already know the answer, a lot of people who now have allergies and never had them before? Yes. So there's been an increase of allergic conditions. Um, parents are saying, you know, I need to see you. I've never had allergies my entire life, but now I'm waking up itching, sneezing, coughing. Um, and so, yeah, it's like an epidemic right now. Yeah. So um, in case anyone hasn't noticed, the, the seasons have been longer. The pollen counts are really, really bad because the seasons are longer. So a lot of people, and then and let's forget about the fact that it's hot one minute and cold the next. <laughs> you know, snow in May, even in right. Michigan and Chicago is weird. Um, so as a matter of fact, we've had frost this week and they've actually okay. said that you need to cover your plants and your garden because um, frost, it'll kill them. Right. So, so the weather has been really bad. So the weather, because of the weather, there are people who have never had any allergy symptoms that are suffering, unfortunately, because they're like, what's this? I don't know what to do. I, you know, I've got to figure this out. So first of all, let's start with what is an allergy symptom? Like, let's just start with environmental allergy. So how would somebody know, oh, this is an allergy and this is not a cold? Great question. Great question. And so you'll start to see a pattern. You'll start to realize, you know, last year in May or March or April, I had itchy eyes, stuffy nose, sneezing. This year again, it started in February. I'm having stuffy eyes, um, stuffy nose, itchy eyes, and I'm sneezing. A cold will usually present. You can have random times. You can have it during the winter season. Usually you have a low grade fever. Associated, you never have fever with allergies. And so some of those are the distinguishing symptoms. With allergies, it's going to be a pattern. Okay. So um, so those that are, you know, like I said, new to this, and last year they were fine, and this year they're like, what is this? Um, I tell people, if it lasts for a long time, then it's probably allergies. Because colds usually come and then they go. They run their That's course, right? reasonable. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. Also, itch component, itchy eyes, itchy ears, itchy top of the mouth, itch, 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 should start you thinking, I may have an allergy. Let me get this checked out. Yeah. So I like that you said that because that reminds me of something else. <laughs> a lot of adults are discovering new food allergies that they never had a food allergy in their life. And now they have a food allergy. And I have one friend who I think she had this allergy her entire life but she didn't know what an allergic reaction was. And itch is one of those things. Like when I, I tell my mom, like when I was little and I would eat something, you know, and then maybe it was cross contamination or something. I'm like, mom, my throat is itching. And she would know that that means I've, you know, that something has gotten in me that shouldn't be in there. Um, or my tongue is itching. Like right. some, you're right, some itching. It's the roof of the mouth, the tongue, the throat, something's itching. And so my friend was like, um, she would eat nuts, but she eat peanuts and she didn't even notice that that's what that was. She goes, I always knew that it like, you know, I'd eat peanut butter and I'd have this itch, but I'm like, girl. Yeah. And so it wasn't until adulthood that it was diagnosed. And she was like, wow, that always happened. I just didn't know that's what it was. 
kids. And, and, and that's so true. I think that, you know, as adults, we, you know, we do all these things for our kiddos, but as adults, sometimes we, we're dismissive, right? We're busy, we're doing this, we're running to our jobs and we kind of dismiss symptoms until something bigger happens. We're at that seafood restaurant and you notice that every time you go to that seafood restaurant, you just love that shrimp, but your mouth is itching. But this time you have hives, you're like, oh, maybe I need to address it. So as adults, you know, we, we dismiss some of these symptoms. We do these things for our kids, but you're absolutely right. It will reveal its head. As you continue, it will eventually stop you in your tracks. So what do we need to do? We need to have a high index of suspicion, especially if you have any of the four allergic conditions, allergies, asthma, eczema, or food allergies amongst your sisters and brothers, your parents or your kiddos. If it's in your family, have a high index of suspicion if you're starting to eat that food in every time your mouth tingles. Yeah. So, um, and so then that answers the question already. A lot of people, when they hear about all my allergies, they were like, well, how did your mom <laughs> know? And well, because my mother is allergic to melons and then she has siblings that have food allergies as well. And so it just, you know, she, in my, my mom's a respiratory therapist too, but she still, does. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That helps. But um, but she, you know, was exposed. So she knew, you know, she was like, this girl clearly has food allergies and we need to get this addressed. I was having oatmeal was my thing in case you've never watched the show before. When I was a baby, after my mother breastfed me, then she started me on oatmeal and oatmeal would immediately send me into an asthma attack because uh. I have anaphylaxis. So um, my mother, like I said, was a respiratory therapist. So she was like, this girl is clearly having an asthma attack. Two, she must be allergic to the oatmeal. That's the only thing here that, you know, that could have done this. So, um, so yeah, so that was my thing. And so my mom, because allergies was kind of in the family, she knew and was like, oh, I think these are food allergies. So then I got tested. Now, please tell people. And I've preached this. But people don't seem to listen. You do not need to be tested for everything, do you? No, you do not, because there is a 50% false positive. In, Did you hear that, everyone? 50%. So what that means, that's a lot. That's a lot. So that means if there's four people in the room and I test everybody for peanuts, two of us, just by the nature of the test, will show a positive skin test. But that does not mean you are clinically reactive. That does not mean you will react when you have peanuts. And so that's what we mean. So a skin test is great, but we need to start with a comprehensive history, which any board certified allergist will take the time to understand your complete allergic profile and then determine the testing afterwards. Yeah, so that's why it's so important. You know, I get it. Parents are like, oh, but my baby was allergic to this. So now I have a new baby. Yeah. No, no, no. That does yeah. not mean <laughs> that you run to the allergist and have the second child tested. And hopefully the allergist would say, no, I'm not going to test this child because they shouldn't, unless there is something there that says, oh, because my sister is not allergic to anything. So had my right. mother had no clue and said, you have to test her because Renee's allergic to, you know, 1 million things. My mother, you know, didn't do that. So my sister has never had an allergy test because she doesn't have allergies. <laughs> and I'd like to add to that, Dr. Renee. I, I think this is a really good point that you're bringing up because we can essentially could create more damage, right? By testing a child for no reason or without any good cause. And how we can create damage is if we test you and milk and egg and wheat show up positive and now you start avoiding those foods, by, pro, by avoiding those foods, you can end up developing that allergy. And not to mention we're affecting the child or adult's nutrition. So, you know, it is super important that Patients that need to be tested are tested, and those that don't really need to just introduce those foods. And so a lot of parents don't seem to understand the whole introducing of foods. I always say, talk to the pediatrician. They have direct, you know, there's there's complete, um, and I don't want to say curriculum, but there's guidelines on how to introduce foods, what foods and when. These things change often because 
for a long time. They didn't introduce nuts until way later. And now they're saying, because there's been a lot of research done in food allergies, thank goodness. And they're saying you can introduce them earlier. And earlier has actually been beneficial for people to not have an allergy, but then you can figure out the allergy also earlier too. So, and obviously you're not feeding a baby peanuts. It would be some sort of peanut butter or something like that. But um, but yeah, they are saying you can have introduced it earlier and it's actually been beneficial. So you just need to talk to your pediatrician to figure out when you introduce these foods. Now, I don't have any children yet, but it's going to be very interesting because I do not purchase nor eat the things that I can't eat. And it is a long list of things that I cannot eat. Right, right. So the only thing I will say of the things that I can't eat that I do buy is eggs because I can eat eggs baked in things. Okay. But I'm not going to make, I don't make scrambled eggs. I don't make omelets. I don't, you know, right. I don't eat them. Right. Um, but no, I don't buy chocolate, nuts, wheat rye barley. I don't buy oranges, um, grapefruits. Um, I can't eat them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, so <laughs> it's going to be very interesting. And then, oh, and the big one, seafood. So it'll be very interesting um, how that happens because I, I do not, and I can't even smell seafood cooking. So that one is really something that I'm like, I don't even know how I would introduce it. I cannot, like, when you stand there and, you know. Yeah, there's <laughs> a problem. But what you bring up are some of the situations I deal with my kiddos who have, like, threatening food allergies. Is some of the situations that I deal with with my patients, adults, and kids in the practice. Because sometimes these parents have seven-year-old who's allergic to peanuts and shellfish, but then the two-year-old is not. And here I'm saying... I need you to introduce these foods and little Johnny, but avoid it in Luke. So what you're, it, it, it's, it's a real thing. Um, and these are the things that an allergist can help you navigate um, so that we can have early introduction in the home, even though another sibling is allergic. And, you know, I tell everyone, my family is not allergic. Renee is. So therefore, they have everything around them. It's okay. my house where I live that right. has nothing that I'm allergic to. Right. In my parents' home that I grew up in, everything was fair game. Mm -hmm. But I was taught at a very young age, since I was born like this, I was taught this is what you can and cannot eat. And so it wasn't a problem. I could sit in a room with them and they would be eating nuts. Now, of course, there is a story where I did get a little curious with the pistachios <laughs> and I stuck one up my nose. I stuck a shell up my nose. And um, my mother couldn't figure out what happened because all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. Because, oh. you know, imagine one, there's a cell blocking my nostril. So that's, you know, already problems. But then I'm allergic to it on top of it. So, yeah. So I'm having an asthma attack and all she can think is we got to go to the hospital. I don't know what to do. I don't know what happened to this girl. I can't help her. And we get to the hospital and that's when they found the shell in my nose and my mother was living. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you really put her through it. But see, we are, so your mother was in the medical profession. My kiddos, I'm a pediatric board certified allergist and adult allergist. And so they are fortunate. But what advice do we give those families that don't have medical professionals? Well, even, I mean, even though my mom was, you know, a medical professional, my dad is not. Um, and obviously my sister is neither. My sister's three years behind me, but my mom really told me, Renee, this is what you're allergic to. I also, because my parents are full-time working parents, spent a lot of time out of their care too. So I was in the care of people that, you know, like my grandparents who are not medical professionals, you yeah, know, fast. right. And aunts and uncles and stuff. So I, my sister too, my sister and I both knew what I was allergic to. So I never, I will tell you 46 years on this earth, I have never relied on anyone to know all of my allergies just because it's my life and I want to live. So therefore I keep track and I'll let you know, I can't eat that. Or I'll ask you what is in that. And so even, like I said, as a little one, I knew better. Now, like I said, I'm the older of the two and my sister was the one that could eat everything. So I was old enough. Like when she came along, I was three, I could talk and I was old enough to talk and walk. And my mother clearly, you know, to say, well, you can't eat that. Or I knew I can't eat that. And Alicia could. It just, that's the way it was, you know? Um, so, and then even with um, washing of hands and stuff, it's so funny that COVID happened and we just washed our hands. Like we wash our hands. That's what we did. Um, I, you know, I can be in a room with children that are eating oranges and stuff. 
I just cannot touch them, obviously. I can touch the outside of an orange, but it's the inside that would, you know, be not so good for me. I just keep to myself, wash my hands, you know. Um, I was young enough. I mean, I'm old enough that I sat in the lunchroom at the table with everybody else. Right. I did not have a separate table, and I ate my lunch. What I did know was that I couldn't share food because yeah. what I could eat and what I could eat and what they could eat was not necessarily what I could eat. So I just right. ate my lunch, and you know, and I never had a problem at school either. Right. I mean, I love this because I think the way I practice and the way I work with my families and my children are really empowerment because there is power in knowledge. And so what you're saying is at a very young age, you were trained to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I also believe that these little ones and these adults, they don't ever want to be sick again. They had those hives, they had that vomiting, they're not interested. They are super intelligent. And as we teach them about these are the foods you can have, these are the foods you can't have, when an adult is trying to celebrate with you and bring you brownies, do we eat it outside of a box? No. If it's not in a box where you can read the label or ask an adult, that's off limits. And so all of this training, we start training them really early on in the clinic, but even as adults, because ultimately they are going to be the best protector um, for themselves. Exactly. And I think that, um, you know, I just read about a parent was really nervous because um, there was some event at the school and they were bringing baked goods or something. But the child is a teen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the parent is like, oh, I'm going to have to leave work early to go across town. To but see, at some point you have got to figure out that you 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 need to teach your child. They need to advocate for themselves. They need, and you know, and she made a comment about the child's very laid back or something. But I mean, I know I'm extremely laid back, especially when it comes to my food allergies, but I'm also 46 years old. So clearly I've done something right. Yes. And I've traveled, I've lived in other countries. I've traveled the world. I, I speak up when I have to speak up. And I also am very good at saying no, thank you. Right, right, right. Those are good things. And so you bring up another great point about what is the relationship between mental health, anxiety with the caregiver and the child. And it's so real. And so at Texas Allergy MD and being an allergist and allergen IQ, the different work forms that I have, these are the things that we incorporate because you can't manage this, Dr. Renee, as you're saying, as an isolated thing. These things go together. And so how do we work with, you know, that parent that feels like in a real feeling, right, that they need to leave their work early to look over that teenager, that needs to be addressed. It's not simply okay to say avoid these foods. All of that anxiety needs to be addressed in order for that child to become a college student and an adult who can manage and thrive and just be empowered with their food allergies. Yes, and my um, and I also say that um, my mom, and I kudos to my parents, but my parents really. They didn't really treat me that different. So therefore, <laughs> I, it really was never a big deal to me, even though, like I said, I was like the only kid in elementary school, middle school that had allergies, like the only, yeah. but, and especially severe as mine are, but I, they never treated me differently. So therefore, and my mother was never anxious. Like she never had that anxiety. She, and we, like I said, we traveled, we travel. I traveled as a child. I travel as an adult. We traveled. My mother did not pack a suitcase of food. Like she was like, we will figure it out when we get there. I'm, you know, Renee won't starve and <laughs> she'll be fine. We ate out at restaurants. As soon as we were able to sit at the table and use our knife and fork correctly, and you being um, Nigerian, you're Nigerian, right? Ghanaian. Ghanaian. Parents right. are from West Africa, right? Yes. So <laughs> my my father is from Antigua, and so I'm sure you understand there is a proper way to use the knife and a fork. <laughs> it's not quite the American way. And it's, it's yeah. involves the whole dance. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I do. I do. Exactly. So me and my sister, that's the way we learned to eat. And once we knew how, my mother and father were like, you can now go to a restaurant. And we would go eat at restaurants. But it was never, we couldn't go eat at restaurants because of Renee's allergies. No, my mother, my father was like, you will not embarrass me in public. You will know how to use the knife and the fork correctly. And so we, you know, and this to this day, that's the way we eat. So, um, so that was the thing about us going to restaurants. And we would go to my father when my, my mother went to the, um, and I'm sure because you're an allergist, you know, my mother went to a respiratory conference um, 
every year, forget what it was, but every year she went to this conference and we stayed home with my dad. And my dad is not really a cook, but my dad would take us to Red Lobster like at least two, three days while she's out of town. I was eating at Red Lobster and yes, I'm allergic to seafood, but I ate off the kids menu. I had fried chicken fingers and fries and my, my dad would have seafood. My sister usually ate off the kids menu too and had the same thing as me and it was fine. And honestly, the, I one time as an adult, I was in med school, I did have an allergic reaction there, but it was not their fault. It was my fault. My fr I never eat the, the biscuits. And my girlfriend was eating the biscuits. And it was me, my sister, one of my girlfriends, and she's eating the biscuits. And I never eat them, but I was really hungry that day. And I was eating the biscuits and she had had shrimp. So uh, between her fingers and the biscuits and then me, so. yeah, and so I got really <laughs> good that day. Um, but that was the only time, and like I said, it was not Red Lobster's fault. It was completely the fault of us at the table, <laughs> me not paying attention, because I should have asked for a separate bo a basket, you know? Sure, sure. And sure. these are the things you do. And you think of these things like I, you know, I talked about with um, last week, I talked about with um, my guest, I, I went to um, Melting Pot and I asked, for, I told them I have severe food allergies and I can't smell da, da, da. They So they had me a separate fondue thing, a whole separate one. So I was nowhere near my friends and all the different things that they ate that I couldn't eat. I had my own. Wow. I know, I he about. So many things, you know, that are yeah. available um, for food allergy, yeah. family, which is super exciting for me as a mom of kiddos with food allergies. Um, but also we were the other thing I would like to add to this discussion is, you know, there are options now. First of all, when we have food allergies, we get diagnosed, we know what to avoid, we carry our EpiPen, we carry two sets with us at all times, wherever we are. Because that's going to be the number one life-saving yep. medication. It's not going to be Zyrtec. It's not going to be Benadryl. It's going to be the EpiPen. The second thing is there are a significant group, about 500 of us board-certified allergists, who are practicing um, immunotherapy treatments. So how can I desensitize myself or decrease my sensitivity for peanut allergy, milk allergy. So there are other options. Avoidance is an option in carry EpiPen, but I'd like to highlight that there are other options. I want So you're the first allergist that I've had on that actually does it. So please talk about, I've talked about there are these options. And in my book, um, my book, the, um, the book for the parents, Mommy, I Can't Breathe, I do talk about oral immunotherapy, but you're the first allergist to come on and talk about it. So please share that information because people are like, huh, what? I'd love to. I'd love to because for me, I love to be able to provide families options. So one option is avoidance. You avoid the food, carry your EpiPen. Second option could be food sublingual immunotherapy, which are food allergy drops that we use. We do it in our clinic and several allergists also practice it where you place the food drops under your tongue and what it's designed to do is to bring you to cross-contamination level protection. So you still have to avoid that peanut, but if you're at an ethnic restaurant or a Chinese restaurant, you will be able to tolerate cross-contamination doses in the event the restaurant has cross-contamination. And then the third option would be like, if your end outcome is you would love to eat peanuts or you would love to have eggs, there's an immunotherapy procedure where we can desensitize you to what you're allergic to. And that looks like having recurrent visits in the allergist office where they introduce it slowly to you in clinic. Okay. So, um, and like she said, there's about 500 allergists across the country that do this because not every allergist is doing it. So you need to check in your area to see if the allergist. And it may be more by now, but there's just 6,000 of us. So there may be more now, more and more allergists are really starting to do immunotherapy procedures. Um, but yes, you can check with your allergist if they're interested. And then also, cause that's, that reminds me of also the allergy shots. Allergy shots saved me. I have environmental allergies, obviously, up the wazoo as well, but I had allergy shots as a kid, and mowing the lawn was one of my chores in high school because I was okay. I did not have a problem. I don't have a problem. I ran this morning outside. I'm fine, and you know, now we have all the little dandelion things flying around. I didn't have a problem. Even That's when, a bit of therapy. Right, and even when they talk about the pollen counts and stuff, I really rarely pay attention because I am usually just fine. 
because of these allergy shots that I had, God only knows, 40 years ago, probably, almost 40 years ago. But clearly they worked. And so I am a huge proponent for allergy shots. But allergy shots, too, like you said, is a form of immunotherapy, which means equals visits in the allergy allergist yes. office yes. quite yes. regularly. Yes. <laughs> This, exactly. Allergy shots are a form of immunotherapy that work immunotherapies with the allergy shots. We are showing the immune system small amounts of the extract and your immune system is becoming more tolerant. So it's becoming desensitized. That's the same thing we do with food immunotherapy, showing the immune system what you're allergic to in a supervised setting, in an allergist office where the doctor and physician is prepared for if there is an allergic reaction. So very, very important. None of these procedures are done at home. This is done under the supervision of the board certified allergist. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, I, I really, really highly recommend allergy shots. I've read so many people talk about they're afraid to start their child in allergy shots, but I I'm, I think that they but are you- the best thing ever. Exactly, best thing ever, especially if your child, I am not one of those people, um, I was not one of those people that was playing outside much. I don't like to get dirty, but <laughs> my mother still thought that it would be beneficial. And I'm glad she did because now I'm able to enjoy picnics and being outside and stuff like that um, without any problems. And so I think that if your child really likes to play outside and stuff, you really probably should think about allergy shots. Is there an age that's too young for them? It depends. So I just had um, a kiddo with fire ant allergy, literally had his foot, we're in Texas, so fire ants, they're here, had his foot in a fire ant mound and had anaphylaxis. No, that's not too young for me. So this kiddo's three, I would not hesitate because the risk of a three-year-old going back into a fire ant mound is way higher than a risk that I'm ever scared about in my clinic. So right. no, um, for pollen allergy, we can start three, four, five with allergy shots. Um, and even if your child is miserable, what about you who's miserable going to the soccer games because you're itching and sneezing? You need allergy shots too. So parent and child, if you're going to commit to doing the work to coming into the allergy clinic, you might as well. You might as well have the whole family in there and get your allergy shots. Life changing. Yeah. And, you, and you're right because I've heard adults that are like, they don't want to do the allergy shots. And I'm like, well, you really should. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be so miserable. I mean, let me tell you, sinus season comes and everyone's like, oh, my sinus, I've never had sinusitis. I have, n- like, I, when I tell you I am good, I'm good. And also, I was allergic to dogs and cats. I, I babysat people with dogs and cats. I don't have a problem. It's life changing. Mm-hmm. It's very, very much so life changing. Um, now, I also, I want to make sure that we understand oral immunotherapy does not work on every single food allergy. Not today. So, we, we, so every allergist can customize different things. Some things are, just, you know, I want to say, Dr. Renee, some things are just, you need to discuss with the allergist. For example, people who come to me who are like, Dr. Mirko, I would love to have shrimp. Well, with, or, so with oral immunotherapy, you would have to have shrimp every day. And usually my kiddos are like, ew, I like it, but I don't want to do this every day. So we offer these therapies, but it's like I always say with all my platforms is, it's a personalized approach. Each allergist needs to take your whole situation and really customize and find out what is right for you. And when she says you, you mm-hmm. could be the adult, but if you are the child, <laughs> right, 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 there right. is a lot of children <laughs> that have allergies that are like, yeah, I'm okay though. Like, I don't need to have that. Parents. Or like me, I am not worried about immunotherapy because I don't miss what I've never had. So I'm quite okay with not eating chocolate ever in life. I'm, I'm okay, I will it's take a it to the grave and I'm okay. But right. you need to, um, and I've read this, how the parent is so into the immunotherapy, but Johnny is like, yeah, no, I don't really want the eggs. If you don't have their buy-in, I can't get you to the finish line. Exactly. That's a real thing. Like if, it, so one of the things we talk about is as a family, that this is not, this is a family affair. Like this is Johnny has, but Johnny's gotta be in. But the parents have to be in because it's, it's, it's laborious. It's a lot of work. I, I endorse it. I think it's great. But it is it is a huge deal to move and come to the clinic every single week. So I agree. The kid has to be in on it. They have to understand it. And the families have to support it. It is a family affair. And it's like even, um, you know, once they get on their maintenance dose and they have to have whatever every day. I mean, if the kid doesn't like it, that's yeah, problem. So <laughs> Yes, these are all that wonderful work. (laughs) These are real situations that need to be discussed 
um, with the physician and the kid needs to be involved every step of the way. We need the kid to be involved in order to be successful. We need the parents to be involved to be successful. So a lot of people with allergies also have asthma. So, and I'm sure that, um, you know, in our community, unfortunately, there's a lot of people walking around that cannot breathe. And I'm like, oh my God, there's no reason. You, you should be, there's way too many drugs on the market now. You should be able to breathe. So how would a parent know that their child has asthma versus bronchitis? Right. Um, so thank you for highlighting that because there are answers, there is help, and we have ways to get access to care. Because I think access to care is some of the reasons why some of the people in our communities are, are walking around um, with chest tightness and wheezing. Asthma presentation in a child can very much be different from that in an adult. Oftentimes in children, what you will see is just a dry cough that wakes them up at night. And oftentimes, I think the reason why it gets missed, people, they're looking for the, that kid was just wheezing and dramatic. Kiddos, they will run around wheezing. They will play football. They will run around. You won't even know until you start listening or start asking the right questions. They're resilient. And so really having that index of suspicion, bringing your, of course, your allergies involved in the picture and knowing if they have significant allergies, have that dry cough that's waking them up at night, coughing for weeks on end, asking the kid that, if they're running, are they always the kid that has a dry cough after that sprint? That all of that, none of that is normal. And then for as adults, how would they know that it's just, I'm out of shape? It's not, I'm just out of shape. That's right. And, and that is one of the big questions. And so again, having that index of suspicion, having, whether you're having chest tightness at rest, wheezing, does it get worse with change of seasons? Cold, all of those are indications that maybe something else is going on here. One of the beauties that we have is once you get involved with an allergist or a pulmonologist, we have a so we listen, but we also have objective measurements. In other words, we can have you blow into a machine, which is called a spirometer or spirometry, and we can look at your lung function and make the diagnosis. So we're going to take all the symptoms that you've been talking about, we may do testing, and we may have you breathe into a machine where the numbers can help us guide us in the diagnosis. And it's so important to get the diagnosis because the amazing thing is there's so many great medications to take you from wheezing to breathing, enjoying life and doing the exercise and activities that you love to do. Yeah. So I can say that I was on meds my whole life. And then, um, when I turned, um, not when I turned about, I think it's been about five years now. My doctor and I had a discussion and the last drug I was on was Advair. And he was like, you know, you really don't have to take this anymore. I think that your lung function is not really going to be drastically improved because of it. And so we went a month and my my test, my test without blowing in a peak flow or anything is how deep could I inhale? Because I didn't know that I couldn't inhale deeply until my lungs had gotten so much better that I was like, this is how you guys been breathing. <gasps> Nobody told me. I was like, I hate that y'all didn't tell me. Had no clue. So I was like, I would just, you know, for a month, he's like, just try it out for a month and see if it works, you know? So I was, I was like, oh, Life is good. And I, said, I really don't <laughs> notice a difference. You're right. I think I can go without. So I haven't taken it. I just carry my, obviously my rescue inhaler, my um, albuterol every day but I don't need daily medication. So just because the doctor puts you on daily medication does not mean that you're going to be on it for the rest of your life. So please don't be afraid to tell your doctor, you know, I think I need a referral for allergists or do you know allergists I could go to because I think that I may have asthma or some allergies or something that need to be looked at. Um, because like I said, I love all of my colleagues that are different types of physicians and specialties. But I really do know that the allergy and immunology, as well as the pulmonologist, they go to special conferences to stay on top of the best treatments, the newest, the latest, the greatest. And that's just information that your, your regular PCP or your internist or your pediatrician may not have. So you want to make sure that you're getting that person that knows exactly all the latest ones that are out there so that they can get you on the best med that, like I said, you might not even have to take it for 10 years. You take it for five and all of a sudden you're much better. 
Um, and I've also been preaching about ed- exercise is so important in asthma. Exercise can really change things. That was the big factor that changed my lungs. I was training for a half marathon. Oh. And when I tell you, me and them little couch to 5K and couch to 5K. And, <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> yeah, it, it literally, my, my allergist was like, what are you doing? Your pulmonary function test is very different from before. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, what? You must be doing something. And I was like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't know. And then I go, oh, I'm training for this stupid race. And he's like, well, it's working. It's working. I was like, is it? I love that. Yeah. So, um, and I mean, to the point, like I said, this morning I did a walk run and I had my inhaler in my pocket, but I never needed it. Whereas when I first started training, I had to use my inhaler before I started because by the time I finished, it would take me like 40 minutes to catch up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, so it's really important. And then um, can you speak to the importance of an action plan for allergies as well as for asthma? Yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, you come to see your doctor, you come to see your specialist. We, we talk so fast during those visits. It's hard to like, you're paying attention, but to be honest with you, patients will retain maybe 10%. They want to hear everything, but there's always things that, you know, you just can't remember. So an action plan is a beautiful way for the allergist to personalize your care. It's not the same care that someone else got. It's specific for you. It has colors in terms of the traffic light, green, the medications you need to take when you're feeling amazing, yellow when you're allergies are flaring up or you have an ear infection, sinus infection, what to do in your yellow plan. And then red is danger zone. What do I need to do? Do I need to activate my physician? What medications do I need to take? It's important for you, but it's also important for what I call your entire ecosystem, your coach, your nurse, your brother, sister, your parents, for them to have an action plan so they know how to manage it. Similarly, we have an action plan for food allergies. So if you have a sesame seed allergy, which is very high these days, or your child has a peanut allergy, it's important for your pediatrician, internal medicine, or your allergist to have a food allergy action plan, which states little Johnny is allergic to this. Little Johnny has a risk factor of asthma and food allergy, which means that there's an increased risk here are the EpiPens and epinephrine auto injectors that Johnny will have. Here are the doses. This is what you're going to do if Johnny has a reaction, when to give Epi, when to give an antihistamine. And here's Johnny's allergist, her phone number, his phone number, and her, his parents. So it's so informative for daycare parents, coaches to have. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I think that people don't realize how important it is that you have an action plan. You yes. have to have an action plan, but it's not good for you to have it and no one know about it. Right. <laughs> right. The school needs to know. Yes. The friends need to know. The, the parents of the friends. The like you said, the coach. Like you said, the ecosystem. Everyone needs to be on the same page. So God forbid yes. something happen and he or she can't speak anymore. People can execute. Exactly. Exactly. And if you guys watched um, last week during Food Allergy Awareness Week, I had my friend Javier Evelyn on and Javier has created this most amazing app allergy. But then he has uh, it's like it looks like a little Mophie. If you know what a Mophie is, the little charger for your cell phone and it fits the Avicu right in it. And when it comes out, it is going to contact all your emergency people to let you let them know where you are. and to know that you have just used your AviQ and so that they can get you help right away in case something happens and you know you don't bounce back right away after you've you know injected yourself but you clearly have had an allergic reaction so i mean I all these things are really 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 important um and i think people like you said the action plan is personalized to you so it makes sure that you know exactly what to do when something happens. Um, you know, I always tell the story. I did not always carry an auto injector because I'm me. And, <laughs> and my mother says I live on the edge. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I had an allergic reaction at the um, chef's ball for the second Obama inauguration. And I did not have an epi. I didn't have an EpiPen. I didn't have an I have nothing. So. Um, we went to Walgreens and I got Benadryl and it worked and I was good. Also, same token, I was talking and I walked into Walgreens myself and purchased it. So therefore, clearly I knew that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't dying. I just 
clearly I knew I had been exposed, right? But I was not dying, thank the Lord. But if you're exposed oh. and you're having symptoms, it's epi first, then Benadryl, then Zyrtec. Yeah. So, um, but like I said, I did not have one. So you had to use what you got. You yes. cannot walk into Walgreens and go buy an auto injector. I'll tell you that today. Um, but you can no. walk, not without a, um, not without a prescription. <laughs> you can walk into Walgreens and buy over the counter antihistamines. So that's why, and that's why we, that's what I did. I mean, that's all I knew to do. I was like, well, I need something. I got to get something now. So we got it. But, um, but yeah, you have to have an action plan. I've had action plans especially for my asthma since the beginning of time. Um, and I tell everyone, because of my age, auto injectors did not come around until I was like right. 10 or 15 something. So they're not, they weren't around since birth. So it was always Benadryl. That's what my mother made sure she always had. And she said that I should always have. And I just didn't always listen to my mom. But <laughs> the children, you should listen to your parents. They really do know what they're doing. If mine are listening, please listen to your mom. Yes, listen. <laughs> she knows. She knows best. <laughs> um, even though my mother was a rest right there, but yeah, she knows. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really important that everyone has an action plan. And if you think that you are having itching of any kind, you may have an allergy and you need to go see an allergist. And it would really be great if you document it so that when you see the allergist, you can give them the full history. Well, you know, at my birthday, we went to such and such and I had shrimp and this is what happened. And then, you know, two months later, I had shrimp again. And this all of that information is going to be crucial information for her to understand, to be able to diagnose you with whatever allergy it is and then to know what to test you for. Yes. Now, are you in the yes. school of thought that I'm in that skin test is best? So at first, I want to harp on your point about not only not only document take pictures because oh, yeah, if you take yeah. pictures of those labels and what you're saying is just amazing because by the time you get you you forgot the story and I knew the story and so really just taking pictures and documentation is gonna be super important by the time you see the allergist. Um and in answer to your question it depends on the patient and we I end up usually do utilizing blood work and skin testing and what's called component testing many different things in order to help the patient. Um, figure out what you're allergic to. The exciting thing right now is that, you know, just like you mentioned about the um, in innovation with allergy, food allergy, you know, there's a lot of innovation in this space. Um, and what's exciting is that there's so many options for patients right now. One of the missions that I have is that we need to have access to care in whatever communities we are in. One of the reasons why sometimes in different communities, Hispanics, African-Americans, that food allergies on the rise, seasonal allergies on the rise, is that there isn't access to a board certified allergist every single time. And that is why I created um, a telemedicine platform called Allergen IQ, where patients in California, Texas, and Florida will have access to board certified allergists and a care team to help you with those conditions. So it's there's there are options right now for people with allergic conditions. And I'm excited to be able to be right in the midst of that innovation. So please, everyone, please visit her website. Um, even if you're not in those states, visit the website because Obviously, she's growing. So, you know, where she sees a need, she'll be okay. able to fill a need and, be, you know, grow to that state as well. But, um, but you know, it's inch by inch, it becomes a cinch. So she's got us, you know, she had to start somewhere. She's got three states. So slowly but surely, I'm sure she will get to all 50. But please make sure you follow, you know, go to her website. Just get, get on her. Yeah, get her, get the, she has an ebook there. Get the information. Um, and then is there any, is there, is there any place else that they should follow you to ask you questions? I know I've seen your, your videos on IG. Yes. You can follow my Instagram at allergen IQ. We also have, um, allergist doc, but really good information on the website, just to read the ebook and okay. to learn information from there. And if I can ever be of service for anybody, I'd love to be. Helpful. So please, please, please make sure that you go to her website and follow her on IG. It's the same thing. Allergen IQ. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. M, because I know that you have given some information that has been very helpful today and people will pay attention that pictures is very important, not only of labels and stuff, but if you're having a reaction, take a picture of the reaction or a video. <laughs> As a matter of fact, today is the anniversary of the day. And I forgot how many years ago it was. I think it was five, five or seven years ago 
that I had the awful reaction from, I will not blast them, but a chain restaurant that paid me as a blogger to its hit to go. And I had grilled vegetables and grilled meat, not fried. The next morning, my face looked like the Joker from here down. It was just huge. And when I woke up, I felt a heaviness on my face and was like, what is that? So I looked in the mirror and was like, oh my God, who is that? And then I, and this was, it was Memorial Day weekend as it is now. So, so I was here in Michigan with my parents visiting from Chicago. And so I go downstairs to my mom and I had a hoodie on. And I said, mom, look at my face. She's like, I can't see anything. Take that hood off. I take the hood off. The woman screams, ah, what happened? And I don't know. I woke up like this. She goes, she goes what did you do? And I go, I washed my makeup off with the with the cloth um and the, you know the you know you buy at the grocery store I washed my makeup with that I don't know I've been, I'm trying to go through things like was it old was this like I can't figure it out my mother I swear took her five minutes she goes call the restaurant it's a delayed reaction this happened to you before there's peanuts or something involved and I'm like huh sure enough I called them this is a restaurant that I used to frequent yes they changed the soy oil and soy, as you know, is part of the nut family. And so soy and I don't get along. And I knew this. So, so as soon as the lady said that on the phone, I go, that's what's happened to me. And um, I won't be eating there anymore because yeah. soy oil is not my friend. And you all shouldn't have changed oils. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But the, today is the anniversary of that. The memory. Yeah, memorial, you'll never forget it. You'll never and I took it. pictures because, like I said, you take pictures. And actually, the pictures are in my book. So you'll see it when you see in the book. They, the pictures are in the book. But I'm getting what I'm getting yes. the book. Yeah, yeah, I took pictures and that's how I, I saw myself. It was like, and actually, my sister wasn't here. So I had sent it to her and she's like, What happened to you? I was like, I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> so, but yeah, and you know, that was scary because that reaction happened while I was sleeping. Yeah. Thank God my throat didn't close or something in my sleep because I wouldn't have woke up. So isn't that crazy? But thank it you. Is crazy. It was just the, you know, just that. It wasn't even hives or anything. It was just that, that swelling. swelling. Mm -hmm. And then it was gone. You know, I took some Benadryl. And, um, you know, once we figured out that it was an allergic reaction, we took I took some Benadryl. And surely by about midday, it was gone. But, yeah, that is um, something that you just have to be hyper vigilant about these things. But it's yes. really important that you take picture, video, because once you get to the doctor, you need to say, look, this is what happened so that they can say, oh, those because there are, you know, there's rashes and there's hives. There is a difference. And you may not know the difference, but we know the difference. So if you take a picture of it and show them, then they can say, oh, you know, that might be poison ivy or this is definitely hives because of something you might have eaten. Do you know what you ate that day? Yeah. So pictures are important, pictures but most importantly, important. pictures of the label of the food. Once you're feeling yeah. that you're epi even the, you know, the label of the food or, you know, when these things happen, so many things are going on. So obviously take care of your epi, do your zertic, but then anything else, get as much information. It's super, super helpful for any of your doctors to help. Thank you so much, Dr. Renee, for Thank all you. the opportunity to, you know, talk about food allergies with you. And as no, our no problem. Thank you so much for helping us this month. And um, I will see you guys next time. Bye. <laughs>